Hello, my name is Lauren and welcome to the Theoretical YouTube channel where no one is more excited to finally be talking about Series 5 experiments than me. I will accept all challenges in the comment section down below. Because here's the thing, so far we've been exploring which Lilo and Stitch experiments are the most dangerous, right? And we've had household pests, civil disturbances, psychological terrors. But today we're looking at Jumba's line of elemental experiments, many of which have powers capable of mass destruction. So we don't have to humor hecklers and baby fires anymore. These are real heavy hitters with unprecedented power. Ah, but that would be irresponsible. Well, okay, most of them. A few. More than one. So let's just go ahead and dive on in and try to make some sense of series five. All right, starting us off pretty strong here, we have the dual experiments 501 and 502, aka yin and yang. And while these two are ultimately decided to be more useful to society when they work together to build new land masses, we'll be evaluating them separately. So, Yin has the ability to shoot powerful jets of water out of each of her eight tentacles. <laughs> Something to note here, Yin cannot create the water that she blasts. But there doesn't seem to be a tangible limit to how much she can store in her body at once. Now, water can certainly be a dangerous weapon, especially in concentrated gusts. Think of water jets that can cut through plastics and even certain metals with highly pressurized jets of water. Hence the name, water jet. I guess sometimes they're mixed with another abrasive substance. So if Yin's tentacles functioned like a modern water jet, then she'd certainly be able to cut through a human being or crucial elements of the city's infrastructure. But there's not really that much evidence in the show that Yin is able to build up quite that much water pressure. More likely, we should compare her blast to those of a fire hose. The pressure of which depends on pump pressure, hose length, diameter, coefficient of friction, and nozzle selection. But according to firehouse.com, in order to get a standard 150 gallon per minute flow rate in a 200 foot hose with a one and three quarter inch diameter, you'll need about 125 to 140 PSI of pressure. But yin cynicals are only about as long as Lilo is tall. Not an exact measurement by any means, but definitely less than 200 feet. So using this helpful pressure calculator found at gates.com because I don't want to do the math myself. Assuming that 1.75 diameter, 150 gallon per minute flow rate, and a normal viscosity for water, but with a three foot hose length, a much more likely height for a six year old, we get this lovely chart, which tells us that Yin's blasts likely travel at about 20 feet per second or 13.6 miles per hour, which doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> But let's assume that Yin blasts you for one second. At 150 gallons per minute, that is 2.5 gallons. Water weighs about 8.3 pounds per gallon, so that's about 20.75 gallons of water hitting you at 13.6 miles per hour. So in order to calculate the amount of kinetic energy hitting you, we need the formula for kinetic energy which is one half of mass times velocity squared. Luckily, we already have the mass, 20.75 pounds, and the velocity, 20 feet per second. So plugging all of that information into the formula, we get 4,140 pound foot squared over second squared, which is a useless unit but it's also equal to 174 joules, which is a pretty standard unit of energy. But that's just one tentacle and Yin is working with eight. So with eight times as much water, assuming all the other specs remain the same, we're actually looking at 1,395 joules of energy. 
How much energy is that? A frustratingly hard thing to say, but let's put it this way. It's the same amount of energy as if you dropped a 10 pound bowling ball from 31.36 meters, which is 102.8 feet if you're a dumb American like me, or a 10 story building if you're really lost at this point. Now the overall impact area of Yin's blasts are larger than a bowling ball, but the damage is certainly comparable. So, you know, avoid getting hit by super powered jet blasts of water from an aggressive alien squid, if that wasn't inherently obvious. Anyway, I'm really inclined to advance Yin into the next round. But what about Yang? I'm not sure that we have the technology capable of shooting balls of magma at the moment. I guess they aren't as useful as water jets. But then how do we go about calculating how dangerous Yang's balls of magma are in real life? What is magma anyway? Magma is a little different than lava in the sense that they're both semi-molten rock, but magma is found under the surface of the earth crust and lava has actually broken through. So I guess Yang shoots balls of lava, even though his semi-molten rock originates above the earth's surface, sort of? The important part is that he shoots semi-molten rock. <laughs> Well, on Earth, most of our magma is found in the mantle, the layer of Earth in between the crust and our two cores. And because magma is an entirely solid, the Earth's crust, or the surface, is resting on that moving part, which is how we have plate tectonics. And when the magma pushes through the cracks in that crust, that's how we get volcanic eruptions. <laughs> But that's not really the issue when it comes to Yang because his blasts won't cause anything seismic. So really our only concern is how hot his lava balls are and what damage they can do on the Earth's surface. Well, obviously they don't stay the same temperature. In fact, it's a plot point that his one true place is with Yin because when her water touches his lava, it cools down to form new solid rock. But let's assume that the moment magma erupts out of Yang's back, it is as hot as magma pushing through the surface of the Earth. According to National Geographic, magma tends to hover somewhere between 1292 and 2372 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's go with the higher end because this video series is absolutely about the worst case scenarios. 2372 degrees is absolutely hot enough to do some major damage to humans and concrete, but it's just below the melting point of steel. So with a direct hit from Yang, it is a guaranteed burn, most likely a fatal one too. But infrastructure-wise, the outer face of a building might be damaged, but the inner bones would remain intact. And technically, the melting point of brick is also too high to be affected by Yang. So even if he rained down destruction on a whole town, the worst damage would be on the roads. Therefore, I decree that Yang will tentatively move on since he's certainly a dangerous foe to be reckoned with, but I have a feeling he won't survive the rest of the episode. What do I know? I just wrote it. Because folks, we're only two experiments into the video and there are some heavy hitters still to come. Number 505 is an experiment named Plut who cleans the world by ingesting trash. Unfortunately, then he turns it into a sludge of concentrated pollution designed to cause ecological disasters. Now, Plut doesn't work as the best allegory for real world climate change because he works fast and he's pretty hard to ignore since he manifests as a giant sludge wielding monster. Like no one's out here saying that oil spills are actually a good thing. And that's really what Plut is. He's a major disruption to the environment whose main danger is disrupting food chains and such, which would then have major ecological ramifications. Like bees going extinct, which messes with pollination, which messes with plants, which messes with what other herbivores can consume. likely has got a whole lecture about the mosquitoes. Oh, everything. Earth is a protected wildlife reserve? Yeah, we've been using it to rebuild the mosquito population, which, need I remind you, is an endangered species. I've seen Jurassic World 3. However, Plut's toxic pollution is a very easily identifiable problem, unlike real world environmental disasters, which normally don't have such a clear cut cause and effect. Meaning that dealing with Plut is as simple as treating the symptoms of the problem. 
unlike other environmental disasters that are already too far in motion. Therefore, Plut's danger this pales in comparison to our own human folly. Number 507 is Woody, a beaver-like experiment that chews wood. Ah yes, the first Series 5 experiment that doesn't make me want to hide underneath my covers. Putting Woody in the most dangerous situation would probably entail releasing him on an old bridge or the wooden coaster at an amusement park, which frankly doesn't have as much potential for high casualty numbers, especially compared to other experiments in this episode and moving forward in the series. Like once the first coaster car goes down, no one's loading more guests on. Right? Unlike Experiment 509, aka Sprout, who has the high potential for a disturbing body count, now Sprout's given power is to turn into an uncontrollable forest of destruction. But what does that mean? Well, Sprout has one main body and then the ability to grow more versions of himself connected through a complex root system. But unlike typical plants, Sprout functions more like a fungus than anything else. With these roots acting much more like mycelium able to transmit information throughout its entirety. Sprout is dangerous for two, possibly three main reasons. The first of which being that he can spread incredibly fast. And like any other invasive species, this means that Sprout could have major ecological ramifications similar to Plut, albeit in a much different method. Since Sprout would be competition for the local flora fauna, since he's kind of both and also neither, he'd likely push similar species to extinction or at least out of the area. But aside from the whole forest of evil thing, there's also the fact that Sprout was fed super fertilizer by Lilo, causing him to grow into this monstrosity! Which, in case you hadn't noticed, makes him a danger to society purely based off of his size. I don't really think I have to explain why you don't want a two-ton Venus flytrap in your backyard. And this growth doesn't seem to be reversible, unlike the other Sprout Sprouts who just needed to be disconnected from the root system to die. But the main Sprout never returns to a normal size. And the moment he's no longer contained in his pineapple water tower prison, he'd be able to recreate his forest of destruction indefinitely. Like a real weed, the only way to stop him is to completely destroy the original roots. And good luck when he's permanently this big, so, so yeah. Sprout is definitely moving on to the next round of consideration. And now the experiment who I believe terrifies me more than any other, number 513, aka Richter. Remember when I said that Yang couldn't cause seismic activity so we didn't have to deal with those ramifications? Well, Richter is able to cause full-blown earthquakes with a simple slappy slap of his tail. Alright, so I'm not a physics expert here, so pretty much take everything I say in this video with a grain of salt. Especially since my brother, the engineering major, has decided that I am apparently on my own for research here. So. That being said, here's what we know about Richter. He appears in the very first episode of the show where his most powerful tail slap results in an earthquake that measures as a five on the Richter scale. Hence the name. The Richter scale is logarithmic, meaning that each increase in level has a 10 times increase in magnitude. A level 5 earthquake is actually pretty moderate, like a 5.0 probably won't make national news. For instance, I get an email anytime there's a 6 point or above earthquake anywhere in the world, because once upon a time I had a geology professor who decided that I needed to wake up each and every morning with a little bit of existential dread. The point is, I get an earthquake email at least a couple times a week, and all of them are more powerful than Richter's quakes. That being said, the damage from an earthquake is not entirely dependent on how hard the earth is quaking. It's also about how well everything is built on top of that quake and earth. So even a five point earthquake can be extremely dangerous if the buildings weren't built with avoiding this type of damage in mind. Unfortunately, Richter was released on an island in the Ring of Fire, so his victims were probably used to a little quaking. But for the sake of this video and comparing Richter to the other experiments, how much energy is contained in a five-point earthquake? Well, luckily the Richter scale uses energy to calculate magnitude, meaning that we 
can figure out how much energy Richter is transferring into the island of Kauai every time he slaps his tail. So let's use the Gutenberg-Richter energy magnitude relation equation to figure that out. Which is log of E, base 10, is equal to 4.4 plus 1.5 m, where energy in joules and magnitude is m. I could have said that better. Log E equals 4.4 plus 1.5 m, where E is energy in joule and m is magnitude. Plugging in Richter's five-point slap, we get that he was able to transfer 794,328,234,724 joules into the island. Or 7.9 billion if you don't want my tongue to fall off. And I don't think I need to point out that this is quite a bit more energy than Yin was able to blast you with. Obviously, the island of Kauai is a much bigger mass that we're dealing with, and kinetic energy is a relationship between mass and velocity. Now, a much bigger mass means a slower velocity, which is how a five-point earthquake in this massive number can be considered safe or moderate. But what if Richter slapped you? He only ever slaps the ground in the show. But to me, it seems possible that he could transfer the same amount of energy into a human being if he wanted to. Again, there's no precedent for this circumstance appearing on the screen. But I'm just saying this would make him by far the most dangerous experiment that we have seen on screen so far. Just saying. Experiment number 515 is Dee Forestrader, who has the ability to cut through trees with his saw blade hands. Wah! Seems like Jumbo was maybe trying to create something that could handle the uncontrollable force of destruction he created a few weeks ago. Anyway, he's not more dangerous than a normal buzzsaw. Is that pretty dangerous? Yes, please don't chop my arms off. But just not dangerous enough to advance into the next round. Number 519 is Splat, who flattens wet pavement. Just don't get in his way. Number 520 is Cannonball. Now, I'm gonna tell you what his power is and then explain why it sounds like he'd be much more dangerous than he actually is. Cannonball has the ability to jump into any body of water and turn the entire thing into a wave. However, that's just not what happens in the series. Sure, he can use every drop from a swimming pool, but the whole goal of his episode is to stop him from jumping in the ocean and creating the world's largest tsunami. Oh no, I thought 520 was our friend, but it's gonna wipe out the whole planet. But throughout the series, Cannonball is shown multiple times to jump in the ocean, and guess what? <laughs> Huh. The entire ocean does not turn into one massive wave. At least any more than you could argue it already is. What Cannonball does create are waves that are frequently safe enough for surfers to use. Even a big wave that's considered safe to surf on is not going to wreck cities demolishing everything in its path. That's why people willingly balance on top of them without knee pads. Therefore, Cannonball and Paper is a lot more dangerous than we actually see in the show. I'm recording this at 10.15 at night and it is like still 85 degrees in my room. It's so, it's so warm. If I'm sweaty, I apologize. Number 521 is Rapper, who wraps things up in tape. Am I considering this dangerous? No, he's useful for keeping your kidnapped victims quiet, but not compared to like half the experiments in this series. Which leads us to one of the secret underdogs of the series, Slushy, aka experiment number 523. Slushy is a freezing experiment, meaning that he has ability to freeze things, which might not initially sound as dangerous as an experiment like Richter. But what actually constitutes freezing? I can tell you it's not an unair conditioned apartment. Freezing is changing matter from a liquid state to a solid state, such as water becoming ice. This happens when the particles in the matter slow down. In other more scientific words, it's when the matter loses thermal energy. Okay, but just because thermal energy isn't as useful in our everyday lives as kinetic energy doesn't mean that it's an unremarkable exchange of energy. In some ways, probably all of them, thermal energy is just another word for the kinetic energy of individual atoms forming up matter like a liquid, solid, or gas. And because the thermal energy of matter depends on how much matter we're actually talking about, increasing mass increases thermal energy. 
Intuitively, this makes sense. Like, which hurts more, a drop of boiling water or a whole bucket? They're the same temperature, but the bucket is going to transfer more thermal energy into you, hence more ouch factor. But interacting with a freezing experiment is going to have the opposite effect. Instead of giving thermal energy, slushy is absorbing it. Okay, maybe not literally absorbing it like a sponge, but my point is that Slushy's powers are really just glorified energy transfer. With snow cones. They have new flavors! So in order to compare him to other experiments, we just need to figure out how much energy he's transferring away from the island of Kauai. And when you actually start to crunch the numbers, let's just say that Slushy is looking more dangerous by the second. In his episode, we see that Slushy is able to turn a Hawaiian heat wave into a blizzard in a matter of mere seconds. The formula to calculate heat transfer is Q equals M times C times delta T, where Q is the heat transfer, M is mass, C is the specific heat capacity of any given material, and delta T is the change in temperature. Some of these things are easier to calculate than others. Luckily, the change in temperature is easy. We go from a heat wave to snow on the ground. According to weatherunderground.com, the highest recorded temperature on Kauai in 2003, the year this episode aired on TV, was on September 23rd. And it was 88 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius. It is almost that hot in this room, I am melting. In order for it to snow, assuming that slushy is affecting air temperature and not pressure, it would have to be at most 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius, because that's the freezing point of water. So our delta T is equal to 56 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius. Now, how do we find the mass of the area slushy is affecting when he freezes the entire island? Well, for starters, calculating the mass of Kauai itself probably isn't the most helpful thing to do, considering Slushy probably froze the air around and above the island, which is a harder number to find, but easier to work with. Kauai is the fourth largest of the Hawaiian islands, with an area of 552 square miles. Even if we don't calculate a few miles offshore just to be safe, that's a lot of air. But where it becomes a massive amount of air is when we realize that this is a three-dimensional space and Slushy was working with the Z-axis too. So how high do we need to calculate? Well, Slushy was able to make it snow, which technically shouldn't have happened unless it was already going to rain, but I digress. So I think it's safe to say that he was affecting the clouds above the island. Clouds form the troposphere of Earth's atmosphere, which is the closest layer to Earth's sea level. Yay! But it also contains the largest percentage of our atmosphere. The troposphere doesn't have a consistent height around the globe. It ranges between 4 and 12 miles, but it's thinnest around the poles. Hawaii, and thus Kauai, are much closer to the equator, so let's estimate about 10 miles for our height. Meaning that Slushy is freezing a block of air that is 5,520 cubic miles. But to actually find the mass of that air, we need to know how dense it is. And unfortunately, the troposphere doesn't have a consistent density either. The further you get from sea level, the thinner the air becomes, which is why we can't stick our heads out airplanes. Well, one of many reasons. Okay, so remember how this was all for fun? Right? And you all should know that I haven't taken calculus in like five years. I mean, I was an English major for crying out loud. So anyway, we're just gonna ignore that the air is changing pressure, okay? So the following numbers are going to be technically incorrect, but like not that incorrect in the grand scheme of things. I just don't remember how to use an integral, okay? And this video has already taken me months to research, so can we get back to the fake cartoon math? I'm not the science one on this channel. Why am I even making this video? So using the density of the air that we breathe every day, the weight of the air block is actually going to be 29,747,043,200,000 kilograms. Which is a ton, metaphorically speaking, because that is well over a billion tons. Now we just need to find the specific heat capacity of air, which is also dependent on density. <laughs> so we'll just use 0.7178 kJ over kg times k, because that's a pretty standard air heat capacity, and I'm tired, I'm so tired. So plugging all of that information into our original equation, we get that Slushy's heat transfer is equal to 663,954,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
or 6.600 trillion for the sake of my poor tongue. But what does that actually mean? Because it seems like a whole awful lot. Well, it does, because that means that Slushy is able to transfer over 663 trillion joules of energy away from a system in a matter of seconds. But the real question here is, what happens to the energy? Is he storing it? You can't destroy energy, so where does it go? Again, thermal energy is just a way of observing the kinetic energy of particles. So the fact that Slushy can control that much energy makes him, at least numerically, incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Let's hope the next one's easy. Number 529 is Digger, who's able to dig holes through planets. But like, all the way through planets or just a little bit because those are two very different powers. And like, Jumbo, the ability to dig through Jupiter is way less impressive than Mercury. Can we get a little precision in terminology here? In the show, we see him dig on an asteroid, but I don't think he goes all the way through. And also, we don't know what the asteroid is made of, so maybe it's just incredibly soft rock. To our I don't know the Mohs scale reading of this thing. It could be made entirely of talc, and maybe Lilo could have used her own fingernails. Unlikely, but who knows? Anyway, Digger never digs a tunnel all the way through Earth, and I don't think there's enough evidence to say that he could if he wanted to. Therefore, the most dangerous thing Digger could do would be make a series of tunnels underneath a city to weaken its foundation, causing hypothetical sinkholes and such. Which is a huge hassle for construction, city planning, and infrastructure, but frankly not dangerous enough to cut it in this series. Sorry Digger, you just ended up in an extremely competitive bracket. Number 5 through 3 is Blowhard, who is able to generate wind strong enough to suspend a small person. Specifically, Mrs. Hasegawa, who is particularly small. Now typically I would try to calculate how much force Blowhard is generating, but this isn't the only wind experiment in the series. And the next one is just a little bit more powerful, so sorry Blowhard, I guess you just can't blow hard enough to stay afloat in the competition. Because number 540 is Foon, who is able to generate more destructive wind blasts. So my camera battery died last night in the middle of filming, which is why it's now tomorrow and the lighting is completely different. Anyway, what was I saying? So similar to Sprout, at one point Foon extraneously becomes a enormous monster due to one of Jumba's other inventions, which amplifies her powers even more. But unlike Sprout, she doesn't actually stay that big, so we're only going to take into account her normal power set. The strongest display of Foon's power is when she's able to knock down six palm trees at one time. Which is impressive because palm trees have evolved to withstand actual typhoon gusts in their natural tropical habitats. Technically, palm trees aren't even made of wood, which helps them not snap when the wind blows. Basically, palm trees are practically impossible to knock down with just naturally occurring wind, since they've been known to withstand hurricanes up to and including level 5, which is the most destructive ones we measure. But for the sake of thoroughness, can we figure out what species of tree Foon knocks down in the show? We absolutely can, because these trees have coconuts on them, which means that they're coconut palm trees, or Cocos nucifera. And looking at this document put out by the Maui County Arborist Committee, a real thing I checked, the coconut palm's wind tolerance is rated as good, meaning that it's on par with other species that survive hurricanes and make for good city planning. So while we can't exactly figure out how fast the wind has to be to knock down a palm tree, we can figure out a minimum strength for Foon's blasts. Because palm trees will survive a level five hurricane, we know that they can survive 157 mile per hour wind. And using that measurement of velocity, we can also figure out the minimum kinetic energy involved. Unfortunately, this also means guessing volumes of air again. Yay! One of Boone's blasts knocks down six palm trees end to end and then barely ruffles the leaves of the next bush. Realistic? No, but it's easier for us, so hooray! According to the same table, your average coconut palm is going to grow to be 100 feet, so with them lying end to end, that's a total of 600 feet. Since Foon's trunk isn't very wide, I think it's safe to assume that the column of air affected is also not very wide. All of the numbers in this series have been vaguely estimated, so let's just say it's a diameter of one foot. 
So that makes the volume of our imaginary air column 0 0.25 pi times 600 feet or 471 cubic feet, which is 13.3 cubic meters. Using the same method of estimating the weight of air that we did with slushy, that means that this air column weighs about 17.24 kilograms. So with a mass of 17.24 kilograms and a velocity of 157 miles per hour or 70.18 meters per second, that gives us a total kinetic energy of at least 42,455.5 joules. Which is not the kind of wind blast that you want hitting you. For instance, it's about 40 times stronger than the water blast we calculated for Yin way back at the beginning of this video. So yeah, Foon is definitely moving on. Number 544 is Thresher, who's designed to smash crops with blunt force. Honestly, this is extremely evil. And if Jumbo released him on a planet to destroy that civilization's food supply, then it would certainly be considered a war crime. However, given everything that we've seen so far, I don't think it's fair to say that Thresher is more dangerous than anything else that can knock over a stock of corn. Such as me when I'm running from the scary clown in the corn maze. Number 566 is Derek who drills holes in the ground. Hold on, two things here. Number one, didn't we already do this guy? And two, his name is Derek? What kind of name for an evil experiment flipped to use his powers for the sake of good is Derek? Um, so Digger didn't move on and his holes were a lot bigger and deeper than Derek, so we're moving on. To the final Series 5 experiment, number 586, aka Tank. Tank eats metal, metabolizes it, and then grows bigger and bigger. Now in any other series, this might be considered an extremely powerful experiment. Last time he would have been competing with moldy bread and lost socks. But Tank's destruction is entirely dependent on his size and the availability of metal. Drop him in an environment with no metal, he will not grow. And while it's not shown on screen how they were able to shrink him back down again, by the time Lilo rescues him in the Snafu episode, Tank has already shrunk back down to his original cuddly size. Presumably it's because he didn't have access to eating metal anymore. Therefore, I do not consider him as dangerous as some of the other experiments in the series and will not move on into the next round. Which starts right now. So who is the most dangerous experiment from series five? Is it Yin, Yang, Sprout, Slushy, Richter, or Foon? Honestly, these are all some of the most dangerous experiments that we've covered in this video series. Any one of them would be a worthy contender to move on. But there can be only one. And right off the bat, I think we can eliminate both Yin and Yang, since we already know that Foon's air blasts are more powerful than Yin's water blasts, by a significant margin. And Yang's power is making magma. Right? Well, magma is dangerous because it's hot. Because that results in a transfer of heat. And it is not hard to see that in terms of heat transfer power, Slushy has Yang beat by an almost unimaginable level. Which just leaves earthquakes, hurricanes, blizzards, and a forest of destruction. What a lovely vacation destination, that Kauai. Anyway, I want to eliminate Sprout here because his main threat is his current massive size or his potential to regrow his mini Sprout connections, which then causes ecological mayhem by disrupting native populations. However, each one of the remaining experiments also has the potential for major ecological ramifications by just straight up killing those other same living creatures. You really think that tropical birds are going to survive alternating gale force winds and freak snowstorms? So sorry Sprout, you're just not a big enough disaster. And then there were three. You might have noticed that I've been calculating the damage that these experiments do in units of energy. Well that's because the dangerousness of each of these disasters is so different from the others that I'm sure you could argue that any one of them is more harmful than the rest. But when you look at the specific jewels involved in each interaction, it's just a good numerical way to tell how worried we should be. Which means that while Foon's wind blasts are probably well over 40,000 joules of energy, they still aren't strong enough to keep her in the game. Which means that it comes down to Richter and slushy kinetic energy versus thermal energy, earthquakes versus blizzards. And I'm really hoping you forgot those two massive numbers from earlier so that I can actually milk this moment for dramatic suspense. The winner is Slushy. And by a lot. 
By only being able to generate five point earthquakes, Richter's maximum energy output topped out at about 794 billion joules. Whereas Slushy's display of freezing capabilities, not even taking into account any of the snow seen in the episode, came out to 663 trillion joules. So yeah, we've definitely got a new powerful champion moving on into the final round of the competition. Good luck, Slushy, because we've still got one series left to cover, and it is certainly not going down without a fight. Especially since Series 6 is the battle slash doomsday category of experiments specifically designed for warfare. So tune back in next time for the end of the world. At least there'll be snow cones. I apologize that this video has been delayed, but after watching it, I hope that you see why. Or at least you appreciated my occasional mental breakdowns as retribution. Slap, 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 slap. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please be sure to give us a like if you did and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, especially so you don't miss the next episode in this series, even if it comes out 12 billion years from now. You can also follow us on Twitter at theory underscore central to grow your own unstoppable forest of destruction, also known as conspiracy threads. And consider supporting us on Patreon like the incredible David W and Alex Toe Quinto who are currently funding my will to live. But that's all I have for you today and I don't believe my poor tongue can take any more. I'm still melting, it's not any cooler. So thanks for watching, kindly redirect your complaints about my math to the AP College Board and I'll see you later. But not you College Board, I escaped your evil clutches long ago. Very funny. TP the Pleakley. Party's over. Time to go.